So thank you. The second message is that I'd like you to pay more attention to what it means to lead. Look, look around. Notice something that you really value, something uh, that impresses you, something you rely on, some remarkable thing you probably take for granted. The fact that it's here is a testament to someone else's leadership. See, this thing that's here now, I mean, we were having discussion just the other night, and like, you know, things we take for granted, like a pillow. Well, that pillow had to be invented. That pillow has touched tens of thousands of hands to get to your bed. And if you track it back to the first set of hands, that first set of hands belonged to someone who saw a world that we didn't see. They saw it, and then they started to lead. So, listen, I, I trust you. I want you to be a better leader because I want your version of the world to be the one I'm living in. Uh, you know, everything good about what we've got, we owe to leadership. And it's true that the world's not all perfect. I mean, we've heard about education and what's wrong with education. We've heard about health, the fact that there's now more obese people than fat people and more fat people than healthy people in this country. But all of that is due to a failure in leadership. So we collectively, we need to get better at it. We need to understand leadership and get better at it. I want people's hearts and minds to change when you speak. I want the walls that confine them, that prevent them from having what they want and being who they want to be, I want those walls to disappear when you speak because they see you walk through them. But in order for that to happen, you're need to, gonna need to dedicate yourself to being a better leader. So if I can get your word on that, I'd like you to stand up now. Just stand up. Now, something interesting just happened, because some of you stood up out of a commitment to lead, and then some of, them, some of you just stood up because a guy on stage said, hey, stand up. That's OK. You know who you are. I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. Just, you can sit down. But really, I want, you to, I want your leadership. In my career, I've uh, attended about 100 years worth of staff meetings. I know that's kind of hard to understand, but it's because it tracks down to roughly nine companies per month for 11 years. So what most executives would have to do in, an, in a, 100 years, I, I've done in the last 11. And my job in these meetings has been the, to be the trusted advisor to the entrepreneurs who lead companies like this. So I've got a kind of a unique perspective on leadership. Uh, I've got to kind of have a front row seat and see what works and doesn't work. Now, in most of these meetings, uh, there was no leadership at all. Most of these meetings, the future escaped the meeting unscathed. <laughs> but then there were those few. There were those few meetings where something really magical happened, where great leadership was present. I was working with a CEO, uh, and this guy's team uh, stopped following him. And he didn't know why. And initially, I didn't know why either, because look, he had all the qualities that we're told great leaders are supposed to have. Uh, number one, he's honest. You know, he was honest. He was clear thinking. He was actually, I would even describe him as a visionary, really smart, even charismatic, which isn't necessary for, uh, for a leader, but it can be nice. Um, although, if he was on stage with me, though, as he spoke, you'd want to like him. He, you'd want to like his ideas, but you, your heart and mind, they just would stay where they were. And it was in working with him that I realized uh, that there's something that every truly great leader does that the ones who aren't so great don't do. Uh, and they, it has to do with their, their relationship to paradox. See, a paradox is a statement or a set of statements that contradicts itself. Uh, and they're very, very powerful. They hold a lot of energy, if you will. When you're presented with a paradox, you really have a choice. You can either ignore it, pretend it's not there. You can take a side true or false, or you can, what I call, hold the paradox. You can believe both 
contradictory statements or implications simultaneously. And this is what great leaders do. So let's talk about the, the, the universal paradox of significance. See, you matter. And I know you, you probably needed me to tell you that. But you can touch a life so deeply and so profoundly that your loss, the impact of your loss would never be forgotten. When you consider the people you touch and the people they touch, the ripple effect of your impact is unfathomable. And also, uh, the magnitude of your insignificance is equally unfathomable. Now, let's, just as an experiment, let's hold these two experiences, right? Hold in your body the truth, the knowledge of your significance. And then without allowing that to dissipate, add to it the unmistakable truth that you aren't worth a damn, that you're barely dust. Can you do that at the same time? Now, as you're doing this, you're doing what I'm calling holding paradox. And leaders who do this, can they, they are standing in the intersection between these two seemingly contradictory truths. And when they do that, they can be, uh, they can be leaders. They can be followed by anyone. Uh, let's look at some other leadership paradoxes. So, you know, the future is uncertain. Would you follow anyone who would deny that the future is uncertain? No. But would you follow anyone who had no idea what the future held? No. All that matters is perspective, and, and there is no truth. But, but really, all that matters is truth, and there's only but one perspective. So leaders that begin to hold these paradoxes instead of taking sides, they have a certain energy to them. As you begin to hold paradox more and more, what you'll find is the area that you're standing in can expand, and then the paradox itself uh, disappears. It turns out there's really only one here, and there's one now. So paradox, in a way, is just lazy thinking. As you're standing here and now and holding the truth of everything, you're inviting your followers to have a higher level of consciousness. And this is translated non-verbally, even in a business meeting, when we're talking about whether or not we're going to expand into the Japanese market or not. The team knows whether you've taken sides or not and have decided either, hey, you guys aren't doing enough, or you've done way more than enough and your contribution is extraordinary. See, both are true. And if you deny one of the two, then you lose the other, the other part. So here's a couple of guys that picked the paradox uh, kind of in a, in a really messy and bad way. Uh, as you lead or become a better entrepreneur, uh, you realize that you have to lead people where they want to go, right? If you can't just lead people arbitrarily into your vision of the future if it has no content or context that matches uh, their reality. Uh, and we've got some of the greatest marketing minds actually in the country in this room. And what they'll tell you is you, you need to understand the inside the customer's mind, understand what they want, understand their emotional hot buttons, and then present them to, to them a solution to the problem they're, they're trying to solve. The more and more you do that, however, the less relevant your picture of the future is, and the, the more you become uh, leading by poll. So uh, Warren Harding campaigned on making no enemies. That was his campaign slogan. Uh, and then uh, he tried to govern entirely by poll, basically making all of the decisions based on majority. And he's, uh, he is well regarded as one of the worst US presidents in history. He, he always makes the, the worst 10 list. In fact, I saw a list where he was ranked lower than the two guys that died after they were in office for a week. 
Uh, and then on the left, we got Plan 9 from Outer Space, which was written and directed by Ed Wood. I used to be in the uh, movie business. Ed Wood is famously the worst movie director of all time. Uh, and he wouldn't listen to anyone but himself. He only paid attention to his own vision. He did no market research. He, no, he had no contact with his customer at all. Uh, and I actually worked on about 300 feature films, most of which uh, make Plan 9 from Outer Space look like Casablanca. So I've worked a lot with people who aren't, aren't polling enough, who've decided they're just following their vision for the future, and everyone else can go to hell. So these guys were not holding the paradox. Now let's talk about a couple of guys that do it well. So these are two of my dad's business mentors, although I don't think my dad's met either one. Um, and I, I kind of thought it'd be fun if we do a mini celebrity death match here between Chopra and P.T. Barnum. Uh, see, Chopra's message is follow your dharma, right? Be not concerned with money or, you know, I, I can't imagine Chopra doing split testing. Uh, and, but the P.T. Barnum says give the people what they want. It doesn't matter if it follows what he thought was going to be good. He presents a show, which is the show that people will buy. So the third message is uh, don't maintain things. You know, if you're going to draw together the paradox of the vision for the world that you have inside you, you being a thought leader, regardless of what people think they want, and also an understanding of where they are and how to speak to them in such a way that they're going to take action. If you're going to draw those together, that puts you right smack dab up against the question, what do you want? And that is a desire question. What do you desire? And desire is the intersection between who you are and who you are ashamed of. Who you are and who you are afraid you are. You can't have desire, really, without shame. Anything that doesn't have a little bit of shame is just not interesting to you. So we believe we're not enough. That creates a desire to fix that problem or prove that it's wrong. And then we really work hard at it. And then we achieve it. And now we've achieved the thing that's proving that we're not, a, not enough. That's disproved that lie. So now we have the marriage and the house and the car and the job and the career and the business. And now we have to maintain those things, but the purpose of creating them was to prove something that can't be proven because it wasn't true in the first place. Uh, so any, anytime you're maintaining anything, you're not free. Now, I'm not saying uh, to not to paint your house or not to pay any attention to your wife. I'm saying approach your each house payment like you're buying that house for the first time. Every time you go to write the mortgage check, you're buying the house again. Do you want it? Every time you interact with your relationship, be in rapture in the moment for that relationship and create it in the moment. If you are maintaining, then you've disconnected from the desire that had you there in the first place, and you're just kind of doing a shame maintenance program. So. With, uh, with those three messages, uh, I hope you're somewhat prepared for the question. When I asked this question to my brother, he, he nearly vomited. And then he said, I, I, can't, I can't talk. When I asked this question of myself, it cost me my marriage, all my money, uh, the future I thought I was living into, uh, and possibly more importantly, this uh, false identity that I thought I had, the person I thought of as me. And I'm very grateful for doing that. Because what emerged is someone who actually has a chance of living the life that I was here to lead. So what's the most dangerous question? I want you to imagine a version of yourself that has no shame. that doesn't have anything to prove, that's already proved everything, that's gotten the validation you always wanted from all the people you've ever wanted it from. Like, declare yourself the winner. 
of any game you could think of playing. 